This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum, bringing you episode 32 of season two of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, August 7th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago. The August 7th uh, issue begins with the Westford Center section. Martin Seavey has returned from a most enjoyable 10 days trip to the White Mountains. In company with an uncle, they lived in the open air and tramped and climbed, carrying their knapsacks on their backs. During the trip, they climbed to the summits of Mounts Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Tyler. Some pretty cold weather with snow flurries were part of of their experience. This in August. The Edward M. Abbott Hose Company held its monthly tryout and drill Tuesday evening with a good attendance, doing some excellent practice work with the extension ladders. The, quote, wilt disease, end quote, of the gypsy moth, which has been referred to so so much in the papers, has been observed in town by Mr. Nesmith and his men. Mr. Nesmith was the tree warden. The next section is called Birthday Party. Mrs. Florence G. Isles gave one of the pleasantest of birthday parties for her daughter, Hilda, Thursday evening of last week. This little lady has seen 13 summers, and this event was a surprise affair. Her schoolmates and friends who were invited gathered at the home of Marjorie Seavey nearby and marched two by two to their friend's home, making a pleasant picture in their pretty summer frocks. Not until they appeared did Hilda know of the event. The guests brought many pretty gifts to their young hostess. Supper was served, the chief ornament of the long flower-trimmed table being the big birthday cake with its lighted candles, the time-honored custom of the ring and thimble, and each guest blowing out a candle with a wish were duly observed. Ice cream, cakes, candies, and many other good things were served. After supper, games, music, and dancing were enjoyed, and the evening's pleasure came to an end all too soon when the young people took their departure, sincerely wishing their young hostess many happy returns of the day. The uh, custom of the ring and thimble that's mentioned here uh, is, is interesting. In this custom, a ring and a thimble were wrapped separately in wax paper and placed in the cake bat, in the cake batter. When the cake was uh, baked and then served, the person receiving the ring was supposed to be the next to marry, and the person receiving the thimble was supposed to become an excellent seamstress. Sometimes a penny and a dime were also wrapped and baked in the cake. Whoever got the penny would be poor, while the dime meant riches. I, th- I think I can see why they didn't do that one quite as often, I think. Uh, the next section is called Bitten, B-I-T-T-E-N. Reverend Charles P. Marshall met with an unfortunate accident last Friday evening. With his next-door neighbor, Mr. Prescott, he has been in the chicken business, and they were much interested in their enterprise, even if it was not on an extensive scale. They had been losing some of their best young chickens at a rapid rate and resorted to setting traps. One of Mrs. George Day's cats got caught in in the trap, but got away, dragging the trap after it. After a good deal of trouble, Mr. Marshall caught the cat, and in an attempt to release it from the trap, the animal, crazed with fright and pain, bit Mr. Marshall's hand quite badly. He went at once to Dr. Wells and had the wounds properly treated, and while they were painful for a time, are much improved, and it is hoped no bad results will follow. I'm happy to report that Reverend Marshall did not contract rabies, as he's lived on for a number of other years. The next uh, section is called Family Outing. Mr. and Mrs. Albert A. Hildreth were host and hostess for a delightful gathering at their home on the Concord Road Thursday of last week. It was a real family party numbering about 14, consisting of Mrs. Hildreth's relatives and friends coming from her hometown of Andover and from Bilrica and Tewksbury. 
Her father and mother, Mr. and Mrs. Bailey from Andover, her sister, Mrs. Troll, and little son and cousins, aunts and friends, made up the group. They came on one, on one of the morning cars and were met by the genial Bert with his big market wagon fitted with many seats. Uh, by cars, they mean the electric trolley cars. This and other conveyances transferred them the two miles to, the, to his home. The party was so large that dinner was in picnic style and was thoroughly enjoyed, as well as the merry sociability, the pleasant surroundings, and the good weather, which is always a contributing factor for an outing of this kind. At sundown, the merry party were conveyed back to the car and to their respective homes. Next section is entitled Wedding. At the Union Congregational Church Wednesday evening at the close of a beautiful summer's day occurred the marriage of Miss Edith Ann Seifer and Elmer Dennis Cole of Washington, D.C. Miss Seifer formerly lived in Westford, the family homestead being in the southerly part of the town where she made her home until the death of her parents. She was a former member of the church that was the scene of Westford's e of Wednesday evenings, nuptials, and for years sung in the choir and was always interested in its activities and best welfare. Immediately following the ceremony, the bridal party took their places in the church parlor where a reception was held and received the felic felicitations of the assembled company. Ice cream and cake and fruit punch were served in charge of caterer Fred, Fred A. Smith. Each guest received a dainty box of wedding cake. Mr. and Mrs. Cole were the recipients of numerous gifts consisting of silver, china, cut glass, linen, and sums of money. After a wedding trip, Mr. and Mrs. Cole will return to their home in Washington, where Mr. Cole is in the jewelry business. They take with them the many good wishes of friends here for a life of happiness and prosperity. Uh, this, I've actually uh, cut out a reading of four paragraphs in this rather lengthy wedding announcement. The next section is the About Town section. Edward Gray, who has been employed on the farm of H.B. Reed for the past two years, has resigned his position and accepted his former position at the Chelmsford Foundry at North Chelmsford. He has secured a house and will move as soon as convenience will permit. Business at the foundry is brisk, and he received several urgent requests to resume his trade. Mr. Reed was fortunate in so competent a man, and Mr. Gray is so reasonable an employer. Andrew Johnson, Wesley O. Hawks, and son have gone to Salt Lake City to the GAR scenery. They attended the Grand Army of the Republic's 43rd National Encampment at Salt Lake City, held August 12th and 13th, 1909. The ball game last Saturday between Westford and Nashua was won by Nashua 5-3, Game today at Ayer between Westford and Shirley. The tree warden and assistant spent a day last week removing a large, overhanging, threatening elm limb that gave evidence of obstructing the electric cars, the sidewalk, and the highway. It hung out its sign at old Captain Pelletia Fletcher's place. That's the house, the old uh, colonial house at 54 Lowell Road, now owned by CRP Decatur. The next section is called Reunion. The second annual reunion of the Spalding Light Cavalry Association will be held at Namnes Lake August 12th. All sorts of business and pleasure compatible with the basis of the association will be evolved, as well as eating, which will be involved. Next paragraph is titled "School Sunday School Excursion. The excursion last week Wednesday to Can Canopy Lake by the Oak Hill, Westford Corner, West Chelmsford, Brookside Sunday School Association, that is the West Chelmsford Methodist Episcopal Church Sunday School, was just what always happens when the, this part of the inhabited earth undertakes to do anything. The weather was dressed in sunshine, the water was calm, and the dust was quiet. Sports for the wealth of your health were tossed around with pleasure, and in this way, the day's most keenly applied treasure. 
Just 82 persons, young, old, tall, small, short, great, and straight, boarded the electrics and took in the lake. A little more poetry from Samuel Taylor. Next is an an obituary. The funeral of Mrs. Elizabeth Collins, wife of Frank Collins, superintendent of George C. Moore's Mills at Brookside, was held from her residence last Saturday. There was a large attendance of relatives and friends. Reverend Charles P. Marshall of the Congregational Church, Westford Center, was the officiating clergyman. The body was sent to Lawrence that day, where services were held Sunday. Burial was at Bellevue Cemetery beside her father, mother, and children. Mrs. Collins died suddenly of acute indigestion and hemorrhage of the stomach. She was hardly past the prime of life, being only 56 years old. The next section is the Graniteville section. Miss Rachel Wall of this village is now visiting relatives in Nashua for a few days. Mr. and Mrs. W.K. Putney, with their son Alfred of Needham, are now visiting at the home of Fred and Miss Jessie Parker in this village. Mr. and Mrs. O. O. W. Sherman of Dermascotta, Maine, have been recent visitors of Dr. and Mrs. W. H. Sherman in, in this village. Uh, Dr. Sherman's father was Oliver Sherman, so I, I'm assuming this O.W. Sherman is probably his father and his mother. Mrs. Teresa Marchione and Mrs. Defoe have recently returned from a v- brief vacation spent at Revere Beach. Reverend J.J. McNamara of St. Catherine's Church came over the road from North Chelmsford on last Sunday with Dr. Haban, H-A-B-A-N, in his new Buick runabout. The baseball club visited here on last Saturday afternoon and met with a trouncing defeat at the hands of the Graniteville Blues by the score of 13-2. The Blues batted Lane, the middle sec pit, sex pitcher in great shape, pounding out 16 hits with a total of 25 bases, every man on the team getting a hit, while several hit for double bases. Thomas McCarthy, age 23, was on the firing line for the locals, and the Middlesex boys got four hits off him, and those were scattered. William Ledwith, age 18, caught him in good shape and nailed all that attempted to steal second, besides finding the ball for a nice single and a home run. In fact, the local club played the best game of the season, only one error being made, and that was excusable. The outfield had some difficult work to do, but pulled everything in that came their way. Hughes at shortstop was a tower of strength, scooping up the hot ones like a veteran and lining them to first like a bullet. Next, we have the Forge Village section. Work has commenced this week on the foundation for the new two-story wool room for Abbott and, Com- Abbott and Company. That's Abbott Worsted Company. They will also erect a new two-story brick mill to be used for spinning and twisting. Mr. Edwards will take charge of the work. The Forge Village Lions added another game to their long list when they defeated the Brookside team last Saturday afternoon at Nabnasset Grove. Reverend Mr. Roberts conducted the services at St. Andrew's Mission last Sunday evening, and there was a good-sized attendance. Mr. and Mrs. George Jackson are still enjoying their vacation in Maine. Mrs. James Libby and niece, Miss Verna Shaw of Easton, Maine, are the guests of Mr. and Mrs. W. E. Parsons. There is as much enthusiasm as ever in the summer cottages of Forge Lake. It's not usually called Lake, but it is here. Every cottage is occupied, and more would come if there were only cottages enough. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending August 7th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope that you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.